Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you again on the second day of our summer school. Today, the team will be a little bit in trying to obtain measurements which we can use then later on to fit to our models and the relation between getting information and models. While yesterday, we were more talking about the pathophysiology, so we go one step further. And in this regard, it's my true pleasure to introduce James Sharp. He's an ICREA research professor here at the Center for Regulatory Genomics, which is connected to the UPF, to the university here. And he's leading a research group on organogenesis. And the nice thing is that he saw, just as several of us are seeing, is that the most important is that we integrate knowledge is what's going on with modeling, with trying to get the right amount of image data in order to try to understand some biological processes in a way, in a systems biology way. And that's, of course, where modeling is really, really important. But at least as important, I think, is getting the right data. And even in order to get the right data, sometimes you have to develop your own imaging techniques or improve imaging techniques. And that's exactly what James is doing, has been doing. So we're looking forward to what you have to tell us. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yes, OK, that seems to be working. Um, Great. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today is specifically um, organogenesis, as just mentioned. So how an organ grows during embryo development. And so I think it's quite, having a look through the schedule of this week, I think uh, it's a bit slightly different focus from uh, qu what quite a lot of the week is about. Um, because it's not explicitly about um, tissue engineering or adult tissue or well-differentiated tissue but how, in the first place, you build uh, an organized um, structure. And as mentioned as well, yes, I'm uh, coordinating a systems biology unit, so this is um, one version of, of what we think of as systems biology, in particular the integration between uh, data and modeling. So what I'm actually going to do is um, try to summarize essentially the kind of journey that we've been on over a while now, actually, like nearly 15 years. Um, I'm not going to go into lots of details, but I am going to cover quite a lot, since this is, I guess, a school, and um, the more you see, the, the, the more useful it is to you. So what I suggest is um, just interrupt me at any point if something's not so clear, because I'm going to go through lots of different things. So um, in a way, it's the journey from starting from a very crude uh, attempt to build a model of limb development up to what we have now. And a lot of it is to do with building tools. So imaging tools on the one hand, but then also modeling tools, so computational tools. So what's interesting for us about um, multicellular systems? I mean, systems biology is already trying to cope with the complexity of single cells. And as you know, they are sort of horribly, horrendously, impossibly complicated. For at least these kind of reasons, the network of interacting molecules, whether proteins, phosphorylations, gene regulation, whatever, have very complicated um, circuit diagrams, topologies per se. A lot of the interactions are nonlinear, and there's tons of feedbacks. And those three things alone make it very difficult to understand uh, or build a model of a single cell. And yet what we want to do already is to make it even more complicated and uh, try to understand multicellular systems where you have another level of feedback. So because cells are communicating with each other, we have not only the feedback of circuits within a given cell, but the, the feedback between cells. A, si a cell signals to its neighbor, can change its state, but its changed state can signal back to the first cell and all kinds of interesting and exciting and complicated things can happen as a result. So immediately we get into spatially extended si situations from ODEs to PDEs and essentially it's a lot of uh, extra feedbacks. So what do a multicellular bunch of cells have to do in development? Well as you know they essentially they all come from one cell at the beginning and so early on you've got lots of cells but they're all the same. So not just that they have the same genome, so the same wiring diagram, the same potential, but they're even actually in the same state. So the, the 
parameters of the system and the variables of the system are kind of uniform. And um, what these cells have to do is to somehow um, specialize into different cell types, but in a spatially controlled way. So a kind of paradigm example of this would be to develop a stripe of expression, let's say the green gene, in one place. So this might be the head end of an organism, this might be where the legs are going to be, and this might be the tail, or this might be different regions of a limb or different regions of an organ. How do you get these cells, when initially they're all the same, to um, make a coordinated choice that will be different from the others? And that question alone, <coughs> just how you design a circuit that's in every single little cell, that will do this kind of thing is a complicated uh, question in its own right. <coughs> so we have been doing quite a lot of that and here's like a little model, a computer simulation of a bunch of cells which uh, are responding. Now in this case, they're responding to a morphogen gradient. So there's something that's already asymmetrical, um, which is something that uh, is very uh, a big issue in developmental biology. Where do the asymmetries come from and which um, sort of asymmetries lead to which other asymmetries. But here, let's assume that there's already something different at one end. There's a smooth gradient, and then the, the network, the program within each cell is to somehow interpret this gradient. So that's quite complicated. But of course, during normal embryogenesis or organogenesis, it's more complicated than that even, because while these cells are communicating with each other, and making decisions, they're also moving. They're also changing position with respect to each other during this whole process. Now that is often seen as a kind of um, hierarchical or sort of one directional system, information flow. We tend to think of the genes, at least you know, molecular biologists, genes and molecules as the clever bit, the sort of brains of the system or the electronic circuit of the system. Every single cell has one, they're making decisions, they're communicating, they're deciding what to do. They can tell at sort of the next scale up cells what to do, to migrate in certain directions, to divide in certain directions. And if you have thousands or hundreds of thousands of cells all being correctly controlled individually, then together you'll get a global result like tissue movements and shape changes to build something like your arm. But of course, it's easy to see that it's not a one-way system at all. Um, if, in this toy example, if we had the, the cells at one end and the other end were already secreting some repressor of the green gene, but a diffusible repressor that's going to flow across the field, then actually just the geometric rearrangement of the tissue could allow that the green gene gets switched on in the middle because it has... Uh, these cells have become further away from these ones than they used to be. The whole point of uh, growth is that the relations of the positions of cells change. So in fact, there is a feedback from tissue movements, this kind of macroscopic scale, down to molecular regulation. And it is in fact a, a feedback at a larger scale. So we've got at least three levels of feedback in a developmental system, in a system that's starting from a ball of cells and trying to build organs. We've got many, many complicated feedbacks within the cell. We've got feedbacks between the cells, and this would be true even if nothing moved. But because everything is moving and this movement is controlled by the system itself, we have a higher level of feedback. And that's why we decided that to understand a particular example of development, the developing limb, we would try to tackle all three levels, which honestly is not being done so much in uh, developmental biology. And it's why we focused a lot on new imaging technologies uh, for this kind of scale and ways of deriving or inferring what the movements are. So we're interested in all of these, um, but we've spent quite a lot at this level and quite a lot at this level, not as much at the single cellular level, actually, but I will show you a bit of that as well. So this is our um, example structure that we're trying to understand, the, uh, the, the vertebrate limb or mammalian limb. And in fact, this starts just as a little ball of cells on the side of the embryo. In humans, this is about a four-week-old embryo, and in mice, 
its 11-day-old uh, embryo. So in fact, even in 11 days, it's gone from a single cell to a very complicated structure. But the limb bud at this point is more or less just a ball of cells, maybe about um, 50,000 cells at this point. And within it, these cells have not yet decided whether they're going to become bone, cartilage, the fingers, the tendons, whatever. And during just a two-day period, they make tons of decisions. So again, bear in mind, there are thousands and thousands of cells around here. This is the expression of SOX9, which probably many of you are familiar with. Um, and this is a labeling of which cells are expressing SOX9. So the critical thing is that a cell just here has decided not to express SOX9, and a cell here has decided to express it, and here it has, and here it's decided not, etc. So since all these cells are very close to each other, how do they know to make the right decision? And this is, of course, prefiguring the entire skeletal arrangement of the limb. So this is a critical um, process. So essentially, we can uh, think of this as two types of question. The molecular patterning, how do cells um, know which genes to switch on and off through all this signaling and interactions? And also, how does the correct um, physical shape of this structure emerge? Since it starts off as something with almost no asymmetry, it's just a sort of ball of cells, and then it, it uh, elongates in a certain direction, then the hand plate widens so that you'll get fingers developing there. So how do these two things happen? So we can go back to our scheme of um, multicellular systems in general. And in our case, we, we look at this all with respect to the limb. So molecular patterning, um, we can look at gene expression patterns in limb buds. And there are potentially hundreds of genes that can be relevant to this process. Um, cellular activities and, and cellular behaviors and the whole tissue movements. And in the lab, we have projects, both data gathering projects and modeling projects at all of these um, stages. And what you'll also see when I go through some of these examples is that we don't yet have a model, any, even a sort of uh, beginning of a model that yet does this whole cycle. So, you know, we believe that Cells know how to behave because of which genes or molecules are being expressed or in their environment. Um, conversely, the tissue movements are due to cell behaviors. So th this is sort of due to this. This is sort of the, the causality is due to this. And these movements also affect dramatically the gene expression patterns. So, so far, the examples I'm going to show you are more like, uh, are, are mostly a single arrow. Like if you know the cell um, the, the 3D or 4D distribution of cell activities, can you predict the tissue movements? Or if you know the full um, description of tissue movements, can you predict the gene expression patterns, etc.? Putting it all together is what we're still sort of just in, in the process of trying to do. And again, in terms of technology for getting data, in some ways what we're looking at is, is types of, you know, almost like omics or going towards omics, trying to get lots and lots of gene expression patterns. But again, the important thing is this is all spatial, and so imaging is, is the key. I mean, essentially, imaging is just, uh, I mean, taking a picture is just um, getting a, you know, a 2D or 3D distribution of certain variables over space. So um, whereas in developmental biology, again, images have mostly been used just to illustrate the point, but here it's really about quantitative data. And then the other thing is that it's not just a case, as some projects seem to be, of gathering as much data as possible, putting it all into a computer, kind of cranking the handle and seeing that something will come out. One of the reasons why we chose the limb bud is because it has a long history, like decades, of history of being studied as an example of organogenesis, which go back way before the molecular biology revolution. And in fact, this really helps because it means that the, the questions, the conceptual questions to be addressed are, are very clear, which is not so much the case, I feel, for many other organ systems that have only been studied more intensively more recently. For example, how does the elongation occur? I mean, it starts as a kind of a ball, and it elongates very specifically in one direction. It's not growing in all directions. 
how is that actually controlled at the cellular level and also at the molecular level? How do you get what we call proximodistal patterning or specification? How do the cells in the hand know that they should make a hand rather than your mid-arm or the, or the upper arm? Because essentially these cells are all the same. And in fact, what we do know is if you transfer cells, the early bud cells from here to here, they can make this structure. They're not predefined that these cells have to make a hand. They're somehow sensing their environment and making decisions with respect to their neighbors. So this is proximal distal patterning. And the other one that we've worked on quite a bit, which is quite fun, is digits. How do the cells make this periodic pattern of being um, sort of uh, specifying towards making a digit and then no digit and digit and no digit and digit, etc. This is digital patterning. And again, there have been debates going on for years and years and even decades about how this process works. And then in the end, of course, um, the value of maybe building a computer model is that we can understand these processes, not just as individual concepts, but how they all interact with each other because they're all happening at the same time growing, specifying along this axis, patterning along this axis. They're all simultaneous processes. And in fact, what's particularly confusing about that, and I think will not be understood until we have a, a good model, is as I said, we've got these different kinds of processes, elongation, regionalization, digit patterning, and other things, shape control, scaling, that if the organ was 20% smaller, everything gets 20% smaller. If the embryo was 20% bigger, everything gets 20% bigger. How do all of these different features that we can observe um, work in a coordinated way? Well, it's complicated partly because it's multi-scale, as I was saying, but also complicated because the, the main signaling pathways that we know of, that um, also many of you are, I'm sure are familiar with, like FGF, WINT, BMP, from all kinds of functional experiments, it looks like FGF has roles to play on all of these processes. So in one bunch of cells, there are FGF patterns, at different FGF ligands, and it's somehow influencing all these different processes. The same for WINTS and the same for BMPs. So how are we really going to disentangle the cause and effect, the control of this system? Um, and the idea is sort of by putting it all together, because if we have different processes like morphogen interpretation versus uh, periodic patterning versus... Um, cellular growth. This is what we think is involved in this process. This is some of the molecules and part of the circuit involved in this process, which I'll be explaining. And again, FGFs and WINTs involved in cell motility and polarity. But you'll see that basically many of these molecules are the same molecules. So FGF, for example, and Hox genes and, and even WINT, they're, they're involved in all of these processes simultaneously. So there seems to be a kind of very complicated circuit that simultaneously does many different things, that, or that we at least conceptualize as different um, functions. The other thing that's sort of quite uh, interesting to, to know as a background to this whole thing of modeling uh, development, modeling multicellular systems, is that um, it actually has a very long history, and especially for limb development. So when I went up to Edinburgh, it was explicitly to do a postdoc to start trying to uh, build a computer model of limb development. And the first thing I discovered is that in Edinburgh, where I had just arrived, before I was even born, just, um, someone had already done it and even published a nature paper. And this was in the 60s. So people were realizing that this was the way to go. Decades ago. I mean, we kind of think that with all our clever computing and stuff, we're very modern. And of course we are. But um, it was clear already a long time ago that this is what had to be done. And some brave people were trying it. So this is the computer <laughs> that this simulation was done. This is not the real simulation. This is just a picture. The simulation looked like this. This whole computer had uh, 24K of RAM. Um, the output was on this printer here, which was uh, these little asterisks printed. Um, and they, they wrote something that I think is just remarkable for, for, you know, <laughs> for this paper back in 1969, that they had decided to explore whether morphogenesis can be simulated in some of its important aspects using a digital computer 
because in those days a computer was still sometimes a person, um, where the cells are represented by numbers stored in the computer and their genetic instructions are represented by parts of the program. I mean, it's prophetic because that's what you know, we're still trying to do now. Um, they also put very sort of modestly, because of the limitations imposed by the methods of printout this, and core store capacity, this 24K as I discovered, there are very compelling reasons for restricting the model, at least in the first instance, to the study of growth patterns in two dimensions only. And we're still publishing two dimensional models actually, you know, decades later. Um, the other thing that I have to you know, admit, and um, it's really important, they, the conclusions that they came to in this paper have turned out you know, 40 years later to be completely correct. There were a bunch of models of this process uh, in the intervening decades that are wrong. Um, and these guys were completely right. So it's not about the idea of building models or even the ability to build simple models. Um, theoretical biology is, is nothing new. It's about integrating data. Um, so I think what has happened is not just that computer you know, power has increased and whatever, but the fact that we have all these amazing ways of, of getting accurate and quantitative data. So I'm going to um, show this whole scheme now with sort of these two halves, gene expression, so the kind of molecular side, and then the um, physical or geometric or mechanical side, tissue movements. And they're kind of linked in both directions. In this direction, uh, how gene networks make patterns over space and time is very influenced by how the tissue moves. So that's the link in this direction. But of course, the link in this direction is, is maybe more obvious um, and more studied, which is um, that molecular changes, molecular processes, both the gene expression, but expression of morphogen gradients, expression of, you know, all kinds of molecular um, states is what tells cells what to do actively, what kind of movements to do, and then that together creates tissue movements. So what we really want to do ideally is you know, get data, which is going to be imaging, integrate data, and then actually do the modeling. And I'm going to go through, um, sort of present it in this kind of a, a layout. And I'm going to talk quite a bit about imaging tools that, that we've developed, and then also, but also about computational tools. So the first thing was how to capture the 3D geometry of an embryo like this. And it might by now, hopefully, seem like a strange question because now we've been able to do it for quite a while. But literally back in, in 2000, when I was first trying to do this, there was not a good way to do this. Um, I was taking these limb buds, I had to cut them into smaller pieces already because a whole limb bud was too big to image under a confocal microscope. And then try and reconstruct these pieces in a computer. And this is not going to be very satisfactory for a model if you, if you really want to predict things. So I had to try something different, something new, and um, it kind of made me realize that at that point there was what we would call this imaging gap. It was very easy to image very small things, microscopy, microscopic things, cells and tissues. And of course, uh, large macroscopic things like human patients were also quite uh, reasonable to, to be imaged. But it was really not clear how to image something like this. They're too big for microscopes and they're too small for MRI or, or um, well, for CT, you can do it in various ways, but uh, then you might lose um, kind of molecular information. So. I decided to try the idea of X-ray CT, but using light. And as some of you will know, the way that CT works is that you shine some kind of rays, like X-rays in this case, through your sample. You capture a quantitative shadow. The shadow from one orientation does not tell you where anything came from. So you can see there's a hole here, the lighter bit, and there's a darker bit. But from one view, you can't tell where it came from. This is sort of the opposite of most microscopy techniques which focus very sharply on one plane and eliminate noise from above and below. But with tomographic reconstructions you just do this process over and over again at different angles and you can then calculate using this back projection algorithm what the distribution was in 3D. So the idea was to try this using light instead of x-rays and luckily for me because I'm not a 
technologist or a physicist or an engineer, uh, sort of officially, but nobody had tried this before. So this is essentially what I tried, putting an embryo, uh, supporting it in agarose, clearing it, and then just taking pictures of it at different angles and then pretending that these pictures, which are really images, they're sort of diffraction-limited focused images, but pretending that they were shadows and seeing whether this would reconstruct using a standard back projection algorithm, which, uh, which would be here. So this one plane here, all the data from that plane will go onto one row of pixels. One angle looks like this. You can't tell where anything's from. And as you reconstruct it, as you accumulate data from different directions, you can simply calculate what's on the inside of the embryo. And I always keep showing this because to me this was just magic. I mean, this radon transform and this back projection, I could not believe that this actually worked. Um, and of course, because you haven't cut the embryo, you just do this for every row of pixels and you get full sections uh, slicing all the way through your sample. So this was, was fantastic. I mean, in the department where I work, a team of five people had been physically cutting embryos and trying to reconstruct them for a decade. Um, and luckily, this made things much, much easier. Not only that, but you could image molecular distributions. So this is the kind of thing that you can do. And here we have uh, just a fluorescent antibody labeling against neurofilament. And again, in terms of size, you know, this is, this is a 12 and a half day mouse embryo. It's probably about eight millimeters from here to here. And it just what hadn't been possible before. So this was very useful for uh, what I wanted to do. In fact, it went way beyond what I really wanted it to do because I just wanted to image simple things like limb buds. But in fact, uh, it, it's becoming a tool for mapping gene expression patterns um, over many different kinds of samples and species. Here you've got two different genes at three different time points. Um, and we can't really call this spatial transcriptomics, but we can um, map and integrate data from many different genes and then map them in 3D. So this was um, one of the exciting kind of <laughs> outcomes of trying this idea. Um, and it meant that, as you've seen, we could map both expression patterns, so something that's molecular, and shapes over time. But what about getting dynamic data? So that was all kind of fixed samples. So we did do a project to try adapting this OPT, optical projection tomography, to work on living limb buds. Um, and you can see an example here, because it essentially it worked, but I'll explain the caveat in a moment. So here's this process that we're interested in, the gradual development of the skeleton in the limb bud. Here is a mouse that has GFP under the control of a gene that's expressed uh, in this way that represents the development of the digits. Here we cultured it in the machine, and from that uh, rotation you can get a 3D image. And then luckily within the machine it actually managed to develop. So you can see that here by the end, 19 hours later, the fingers have developed. I mean, which means, um, I mean they're not fingers of course, it just means that some genes have been switched on in the cells that are going to form the fingers. This is just about patterning, not about differentiation. And that meant that we could indeed get a 3D movie over time of this process. So again, this is digit uh, four, as it is, uh, as it happens, four, three, two. Your fingers always develop in, in mammals in this order, that three first, then two, uh, sorry, four, then three, then two. And this ex extension of green is not cell movement or tissue movement. It's genes switching on a gene. Uh, sorry, cells switching on a gene. So the cells are just sitting there and then they're just deciding to switch on this gene and, and the same here and the same here. It's not about flowing or movement of tissue or cells. So in principle, we could get all the data that we want like this, but this is just not practical for a mouse um, developmental system. For one thing, I mean, this depends on making a transgenic mouse that is expressing GFP under the control of a gene and we can't just make uh, lines for every single gene we're interested in. Um, well, and there's another problem that I'll come back to in a second. But 
the other, the other sort of limitation of this is we don't here have single cell resolution. So we're not tracking individual cells. Because remember, there are about, by this point, uh, three or 400,000 cells. And the resolution is not high enough to track individual cells. So if we see shape changes, which we do, how much does it tell us about the underlying tissue movement? Um, well, in fact, in this kind of cartoon, you can see if we know that this shape moves to this shape, if that's the only thing we know, we just know the surface, um, it doesn't tell us much about the movements. You need some kind of landmarks because there are many different ways that the tissue of this shape could warp or twist or morph into another, into another shape. So we need some kind of landmarks, and we did that with live OPT as well, which is just on the surface putting fluorescent beads um, and doing 3D reconstructions of those. And then over time, you can see the limb bud growing in the machine as well, and you can see the movements of these, these little beads. And since we have them all in 3D, you can sort of track that. But this is just the surface. Doing this for the internal tissue, there are methods that you can label randomly, stochastically, cells internally. And we have managed to do that to a certain extent. But it's proven very difficult. And the main reason is, is, uh, is this, that the main limitation for imaging mouse organogenesis at really organ stages, so these are like embryos of E, 11.5 or 12.5, they don't live or grow very well in vitro. Very young mouse stages can, but at these stages they just don't. We originally were doing it like this, taking a piece of the embryo and um, skewering it and then sort of orienting it with this uh, device. And in fact, some processes continue, but real growth doesn't continue very well. So we did then explore a bit doing a whole conceptus uh, method where instead of taking a part of the embryo, you take the whole embryo plus the yolk sac plus the placenta and keep everything intact because actually the thing missing from here for this limb bud is blood flow. There is already by this point a beating heart and a circulatory system and without blood flowing through uh, these uh, limb buds, they will just not grow. And I think this, of course, is um, recognized in general in tissue engineering that somehow getting uh, blood flow capillaries and, and flow through tissue in vitro is going to be essential to get above a certain size. So we, we tried this. And in fact, this works. But it is really uh, tricky to do this. So um, this is what I just described, the whole embryo. You can see the heart is still beating. You might even be able to just sort of make out that there's blood flowing in these capillaries here. Of course, you have to have the whole thing. You have to have the placenta intact as well because the circulatory system is going through the placenta as well. Um, and it worked because we got really good limb development in vitro that way. But it's just too much of a pain. <laughs> so we essentially had to go to a whole different um, idea or philosophy for a lot of our data capture, which is what I'll be talking about now which is how to infer dynamic things from static data. It's kind of frustrating. If you're working in zebrafish or drosophila, you wouldn't dream of doing this because you can image those embryos alive. But mouse embryos don't grow normally outside of the uterus. So, so we did do some of this, and this has contributed to some of our data using this con whole conceptus culture with live OPT and we can get shapes and, and, and dynamics. But really we're going to have to focus on static snapshots, like 3D snapshots of all kinds of data. So then the next kind of problem um, became apparent. And in fact, of course, this whole you know, project, this whole talk is essentially like a series of problems and, and how we overcame them. This is, is something that is, I'm not sure how you know, appreciated it is, that embryos, if you harvest them, even from one litter, from one mouse, are not the same age. And if you're trying to understand a process that's very dynamic, hour by hour, um, assuming that all the embryos that came from one litter, from one pregnant female, assuming they're the same age, is going to be completely wrong. Um, these are all from one litter. And this stage is very much behind this stage. In fact, with the system that we've developed, as I showed, these are almost 24 hours difference in developmental time. 
and just coming from one litter from one, one mouth. So one of, our, the, one of the first computational tools we had to develop was a staging system and we chose to use the changing shape of the limb bud over time as the metric for, um, for development. Um, without going into the details, we had to harvest and take photos, 2D photos of hundreds of, of limb buds and try to work out what is the average trajectory of this shape change over time. So here you can see time going from, from the bottom up to the top, from the point when there's no limb bud on the embryo to gradually a time at the end where you've got a clear outline of a limb bud with the five fingers formed there. Uh, and in fact, this is a, um, a publicly accessible website if anyone actually wants to stage embryos. It's, I think, the, for the stages that we've got, it's the most accurate way of doing it. Statistically, we can show that you can stage an embryo to plus or minus one hour by just taking a photo of the limb bud, drawing a spline around it, and uh, this will, will tell you the age. It uh, gives you a result kind of like this with a confidence limit. And then you can actually go and analyze in real detail the, the uh, temporal evolution of all your gene expression patterns, sort of hour by hour. So that was one of our first tools there that was necessary for dealing with static data. Now, how are we going to actually take, how are we going to get a continuous description of these tissue movements from static data? And for that, we've, we've switched into 2D. Some of our projects are in 3D, some of the projects in 2D, and we kind of jump back and forth depending on what's necessary or convenient. Um, we've got shapes at many different time points, as I've shown you. And we realized then the other, another piece of information that we could use to define how the tissue moves is clonal data. Clonal data or clones means labeling a single cell at a certain time point and then seeing where all the descendants are, maybe 24 hours or 48 hours later. And then integrating that somehow. So we've developed this thing that we call a morpher movie because it's a movie in the sense that it's just descriptive, it's not a model, but it's uh, descriptive of the changing shape and movements over time. And we started with this, which I've already shown you. And from this, we can make simple little models like this. So this is just um, a kind of a simple two-dimensional mesh that's remeshed every hour. And if we have a hypothetical distribution of movements, you can label a single point at a certain time point and see what's the probability distribution of a space of where the descendants of that cell could end up if that map was correct. So the map that I've just shown you is just invented, hypothetical. But if that map was correct, then a cell that started here, the descendants would have to be roughly in this distribution. So from that, we were then able to create many different maps, sort of hypothetical maps of how the tissue moves and compare it to real clonal data. So we digitized all of these clones. We have these maps all as digital things. And then you basically compare every map with every clone and look for uh, the best fit. And the best fit allowed us to produce what we think was the first accurate description of uh, the, in 2D, but of these movements over time for the mouse limb bud. And it all came from dead fixed data, static data. So that would be how to describe this side, tissue movements, a continuous description of, of these movements. How are we going to get a continuous description of the genes switching on and off and their expression domains and the dynamics of that? Well, essentially using a similar thing. So we can, of course, get a gene expression pattern at any, at any moment, but we just need some way to integrate these with the movements that we believe are happening. And I'll show you how this works. So it's easy to do what's called a whole mount uh, in situ hybridization for any gene you, you're interested in. This is actually the benefit of looking at gene expression patterns rather than proteins with antibodies. If you want to look at where a protein is distributed, you need an antibody against it. And for most proteins, there are no functioning antibodies. For a gene, it's much, much easier. You just know the sequence, 
and you can make a probe and you can do it in situ. So any gene in the genome can be analyzed in this way and at different time points. So here is a particular gene at different time points and it's expressed in these cells and not expressed in these cells. In fact, it's not just an on-off thing. You have kind of gradients. So we then developed another little piece of software that for any given time point of our map, we can take a gene expression uh, photo and align it uh, for that particular time point and kind of map these levels. These are not quantitatively accurate. They're kind of qualitatively um, suitable, let's say. I mean, you can distinguish between high expression, medium expression, and, and no expression. Um, so that's one time point and one gene. And in fact, because of the, the, the automatic staging system, we can make this process a bit more automated now. But what we really want, of course, is many, many time points and many different genes. So here are three genes, Hox, A13, A11, and MACE, mapped um, over time. These three genes are of interest because these are ones that are believed in early development, well, in this developmental phase, to distinguish between your hand and then the, the forearm and the upper arm. HOXA13 basically specifies the cells that will make your hand. <coughs> A11, the, this part of your arm, and then MACE, this part of your arm. So you can make little movies of that. <coughs> now I emphasize that these movies, these are not models yet. This is just a representation of data because later I'll show you movies that hopefully look very much like these but they're very different because it's actually a dynamical predictive model. So that's data capture again, all from images and we now have been able to integrate data on tissue movements and data on gene expression patterns. Can we do all of this in 3D? We're kind of doing this all in 3D now but it not surprisingly takes a lot longer. Um, in terms of the movements, we're essentially using a similar approach that I, that I described. A little bit we're using the live data that I mentioned from live OPT, but uh, in particular we're using again lots of fixed clones, but 3D clones in this, in this case, and much more controlled ones. So going briefly through that, you can see here are different limb buds of different ages, with clones of different sizes. That means that a, a particular cell was labeled at different time points in the past and all the descendants um, are labeled later. And to image that, we've been using another imaging technique that I'll just show you because um, it's, it's related in terms of applications to OPT, but it works in a very different way. So if we've got these kind of rough scales up here from hundreds of microns to millimeters to centimeters, OPT, what I showed you, is great in, in this kind of size range. <clears throat> but another technique called SPIM or light sheet microscopy is actually good for this smaller end of, of the mesoscopic range. And we've been developing this technology as well, uh, along with you know, a number of other labs. So this is an example of the kind of thing that SPIM can do, light sheet microscopy, watching dynamically a process in a zebrafish embryo. It can also do fantastic static reconstructions of slightly older mouse embryo uh, stages. So this is a mouse head, again labeled for all the nerves. And then OPT, though, is still more suitable for things like this, which is a project looking at diabetes and looking at uh, mouse models of diabetes, where we were able to analyze um, many, many pancreases in an efficient way to quantify beta cell mass and, and stuff like that. So this is just an overview of the kind of techniques that we think of as mesoscopic imaging now, in between microscopy and macroscopic imaging. So with uh, SPIM, we're able to uh, pinpoint cell by cell, every cell in these, in these clones, and you get something like this. This is one particular clone. Here we've got every cell. Um, it is... A, as I said before, it's unfortunate that we can't do this in a live sample, but uh, not only because it's difficult to grow embryos, but also that when they're alive, they're not transparent enough. So from here instead, we can map clones from many different experiments. And each clone, of course, as in the 2D case, is, has got some information about how the tissue must have distorted to, uh, to, to make this growth. 
And to cut the long story short there, we're kind of using various kind of inverse methods and finite element modeling to fit what must be the tissue movements to satisfy all of this data over time and space. So that's really, I think, all I'm going to say uh, about all this capturing, capturing data. Um, and even about integrating. Because I've shown you these kind of tools that we've really had to work on for, for years and years to integrate all these different types of, of data. So we've got the imaging done and we've got the integration done. So what about actually asking with all of this some scientific questions? And I'll just go through briefly uh, a couple of our modeling projects to give you a feeling of how we use all of this. Well, the first one, elongation. Um, there was a very long-standing theory called the proliferation gradient hypothesis. This is a limb bud. And it's known that at the tip of the limb bud, certain uh, growth factors are secreted and diffuse. So you get a kind of a gradient with more of the growth factor at the tip and less further back. So the very kind of simple idea that had been around for about, I think about 40 years by the time we published this paper, was that these growth factors simply stimulate proliferation. They just stimulate growth. But nothing more is really specified than that. So this would be a kind of isotropic behavior. A non-uniform, but nevertheless isotropic. So more growth here, volumetric expansion per unit time. Well, so what we did was just to test that using this kind of data and images. We used finite element modeling, this particular package. And we took two kinds of quantitative data. One is the actual measured 3D distribution of growth rates, which you can do with this technique, um, a sort of pul uh, pulse chase experiment with BRDU and IDDU. So we built 3D maps of the um, cell cycle time. And then the other data was, of course, the real shapes from OPT imaging. But when you put these two things together and try and run the model just as a forward kind of problem. This is the limb bud at an early stage. This is the real limb bud shape six hours later. And when you run the model, it doesn't do anything like the reality. It basically blows up like a balloon. It doesn't go in one direction. Now, we did lots of things for this paper that um, I'm happy to talk about later if anyone's interested. I mean, lots of, so we did, it, we did it as an inverse problem as well to optimize what pattern of cell proliferation could theoretically explain the shape change. But essentially the conclusion from everything is um, just controlling growth rates per se, isotropically, cannot explain limb bud development. Um, this is uh, other kind of comparisons. And the kind of ironic thing here, and I think it's a very important thing to worry about, is that there were already in between the, the sort of early days and our model, there were three papers published on modeling limb growth, which all, they didn't sort of prove or anything. They just basically adopted this idea because it was in the literature, which was that growth was concentrated at the tip and that this tip concentrated growth would be sufficient to explain the elongation. And they made models of it and the models worked. And they made many different types of model. This one was a finite element model this was a kind of um, vertex model, and there was a cellular POTS model as well. All published and all saying, yes, this is how the limb grows. But this is not how the limb grows. It's easy to make a model that will just replicate what you think is happening. Uh, but of course, it doesn't prove that it's happening, and it's maybe even counterproductive. Because to the then experimentalists, biologists, who then read these modeling papers, they think, oh, well, my idea is even being shown in a computational model. So that's even more support, um, and this is just not true. Why did they all make, I mean, how did they all make a mistake? Because they didn't bother to actually fit it with real quantitative data. It was just more a conceptual model. And conceptually, the idea is possible that you have more growth at the tip and that you elongate. But when you m compare it with the real data, it's just not possible. So it made us realize that there must be something oriented going on, some anisotropic cell behaviors or activities. Um, so 
this was our first example of a kind of modeling project here. And very briefly, it forced us to go back to do more kinds of imaging and develop more kinds of things that I won't go through um, to somehow watch these cells in a developing limb bud. And as I mentioned, in the mice, it's just not doable. So we switched to chicken embryos because they're more or less the same um, to watch how the cells move during limb development and came to the conclusion, well, just realized by looking down the microscope, they're not randomly oriented at all. They're very strongly oriented in certain directions. They're very complicated cells. They're pulling and pushing in all kinds of funny ways. Um, and so this led to our next hypothesis. Our next hypothesis was that, and is currently still, that essentially there's a convergent extension process going on, that for any little block of tissue, cells are trying to intercalate all the time. This would lead to an expansion in, in the other two dimensions. But because of the arrangement of the blocks, and I'm going through this quite fast, but just to give you a flavor of it, um, because of the arrangement of the tissue and the arrangement of this intercalation, it allows that the limb bud doesn't expand um, in these directions, but only elongates in one direction. So we then went back to modeling to explore that. And in this case, we, we have actually used a cellular POTS model, um, which is a type of model that can represent fairly arbitrary shaped cells. Um, it can be done in 3D. And in this case, the, the people that uh, actually were doing this modeling, Giulio Belmonte in James Glazer's lab, they had, already, they had been recently developing an extension of this process whereby cells could grab onto each other at a certain distance and pull in order to represent a kind of intercalation process. So for example, here, if this cell five and cell two pull towards each other, they will pull they will push cells four and three apart. So you'll get convergence this way and extension this way. Um, you then have to specify how these links will be oriented with respect to gradients. And in this case, it's a WIMP3 gradient coming from the ectoderm. And in this way, we could test our hypothesis. And essentially, we can just show, which doesn't prove that it's right, but we can show that this hypothesis at least is consistent with, uh, with limb development. So on the side of tissue movements and uh, mechanics and things, this was another modeling project that we've done. So here with finite elements, here with uh, cellular pots modeling. And in fact, in the lab, we're not at all, we try not to be wedded to any particular modeling framework or formalism. We just try whichever ones are, are useful. Um, regionalization, how you get how the cells know that they're in the hand versus here versus here. This we've been doing, gene networks we've been doing so far mostly in 2D because it is more complicated. I showed you already this. This is simply mapping how these genes behave over time. But in the literature, it's fairly clear that um, these genes seem to be controlled by upstream gradients, and a gr upstream gradient of retinoic acid, which is coming from the body and another upstream gradient of FGF, which is coming from the tip. So you've got two opposing gradients in opposite directions. And the question is, if these are the inputs and these are the known outputs, what is the structure of the gene regulatory circuit which will do that conversion, that will take these in out inputs and make these outputs? And for that, we've been developing kind of reverse engineering approach. So we take a hypothetical network We've got our real output uh, results here. And of course, this network requires parameters. So we just take random parameters and simulate. And these three genes, these three colors, are these three genes. And you can see that if you just take random parameter values, you get patterns that do not fit very well the reality. But because this data is all digitized, and because the model is, of course, a digital model, we can do automated comparison between the output of the model and these uh, gene expression patterns. And again, to emphasize, this is comparisons over space and time. So we're comparing at every time point during development for every gene, gene and for every triangle, how well they fit. And then you can put that into a reverse engineering kind of parameter optimization loop. So as you go through iterations, the result gradually improves such that here we've got the best result for this circuit. 
and we then explore many different circuits and see which circuit is the one that would fit best. And this is the result, the circuit that seems to fit best. And this is the actual uh, dynamics. So the, the movies that I was showing you before was just digitizing the data, but this movie is a uh, dynamical PDE model where we just give the initial conditions, the parameter values, and it uh, grows like that. Not just the initial conditions, I have to confess. I mean, the growth movements here are not being controlled by the genes, just to be clear. The growth movements are given as well. So, then I'm just, just going to show you the final example of a modeling project, again on this side, in terms of gene expression patterns. And it's quite uh, a fun one, because it's about a, a debate that really was going on for, for ages and ages in the field, which is how you specify your fingers. And really it's been a debate between um, the principles of local self-organization versus positional information, which were both um, championed in a way by, by these two uh, different people. This one much more famous than this one. In developmental biology, Lewis Wolpert is very famous, but um, Alan Turing is, of course, famous to most people in the world. Um, although most people in the world don't realize that two years before he committed suicide, he actually published a paper on morphogenesis. And his interest was actually in developmental biology. It wasn't some kind of mathematical curiosity. He was actually all of a sudden obsessed with how embryos develop. And it always seems from, you know, in the hindsight of, of these days where we have developmental biology and computing and things as distinct fields, weird as to why he would be interested in these two different things. I mean, one thing you have to remember is that computer science didn't exist because, I mean, he was one of the ones who invented the computer. Um, that wasn't really a distinct thing. His obsession was with intelligence, as you probably know as well, like the Turing test, artificial intelligence, or whatever. He spent a lot of time trying to work out what intelligence meant. That's how he kind of developed the idea of an algorithm, which was a kind of formalism of solving a problem. Um, but in later life, he started to realize, uh, you know, as they had various attempts of building computers, well, what exists in the universe as the most clear example of a very intelligent machine? And it's the brain. And he all of a sudden at the end got obsessed with trying to understand how does the brain build itself? How does a brain as a physical object come into existence in the world? And for that reason, he got interested in development. And for that reason, he published this paper, um, which was absolutely you know, astounding kind of breakthrough. It started a whole little field of um, theoretical uh, pattern formation in, in biology. And what did he discover? He sort of discovered, stroke, you know, invented, that if you have just a system of two molecules that diffuse uh, but also react with each other, in a single cell this doesn't look like it could do much and it probably can't do that much. It could be homeostatic or it could oscillate, but it can't do that much. You've got an activator and a repressor. But when you have this distributed over space, so you have this same system, every single point in space, and you allow these to diffuse in just the right way, this quite uh, remarkable thing can happen. In this little toy simulation, the colors represent the concentrations of one of these, and you just spontaneously get a periodic pattern. So the key thing here is that the reason why these cells switched on the gene, and the reason why these cells switched on the gene is not different. It's just a local self-organizing patterning system. You've got, in a way, three stripes here, but it's not because they're in different positions. The cells don't really know anything. They're just reacting with each other. The dominant alternative view in the field has been that in developmental systems, uh, there are such things as morphogen gradients or other kind of things distributed over space of the cells. And cells read out this positional information and therefore decide what to do. So in that kind of framework, the cells here would have switched on SOX9, let's call it, because they know they're at position one. And the cells here would have switched on this, the, the same gene, but because they know they're at a different position. And the cells in between 
would not have switched on the genes because they know that they're at the position in between. Now, where did this idea come from? It came from a very, very convincing experiment and very famous ones in development back in 1968, where from a chick wing, um, if you take a little piece of the very early wing, so days earlier than this when you've just got a little bud, if you take um, a piece from the posterior side and graft it onto the anterior side, you go from a normal wing, which has got these digits, to a full mirror image duplication. And that looks to all the world like this kind of French flag model, where at different positions from something, different distances, you specify different things. And because you've now taken part of this uh, organizer and put it on the other side, you've got a gradient this way and a gradient this way, and therefore you've got more fingers and you've got all the different identities. Now, this cannot be totally wrong, but I'm not going to go into that right now. The point is that these were two very, very different um, explanations to uh, explain a periodic pattern of digits. Now, we've been doing many things, but I'm just going to show a couple. And this is a mouse limb bud. In green is where SOX9 is being expressed. And one of the kind of observations that's been around for ages, but we've just done it in a more kind of modern way, is this, that if you take cells, even cells that have not chosen to become the gaps between the fingers, but then you culture them in micromass, as, and some, I'm sure that some of you are doing similar kinds of experiments, they will spontaneously switch on SOX9, but not all the cells but not in a random pattern, but actually in something that looks a bit like a Turing pattern. I mean, if you don't take just the negative cells, if you take cells, mesenchymal cells from the limb bud in general, you get beautiful Turing patterns. But even if you take the cells that have apparently chosen not to become cartilage, not to become fingers, uh, they will switch on SOX9 if the you know, fingery neighbors have gone. Um, maybe even more remarkable, if you take just the SOX9 positive cells and culture them, some of these cells will switch off SOX9, but again, in a patterned way, not just in some stochastic random process. This is, this is not very great. I've got to get a better movie of this. But um, it really looks to all the world like a local self-organizing system. Also highlighting that SOX9, I would say, is not a, um, a sort of you know, a, um, a differentiation marker. It's a gene that's involved in the dynamic process of deciding which cells will become fingers and which will not, and it's very dynamic, and it can be switched off just as easily as it can be switched on. So we then use these kind of things to screen which are the molecules. I mean, the big question that all the biologists want, they don't really care that much about the model. They just want to know what are the, the genes, what are the signaling pathways. So we use this system to do differential microarrays and RNA-seq and transcriptomics and things to find which genes seem to have patterns that could be relevant for this stripey process, and in particular, which signaling pathways, because the Turing system depends on having at least two diffusible molecules, and the diffusible molecules in these cases are signaling molecules. Um, our conclusions are that essentially it's BMP pathway and the Wnt pathway. I won't go through the details now, but I'm happy to, to go through them if anyone's interested. But we have very precise um, time course of how different aspects of these pathways get switched on. And as a control, for example, FGF does not, does not have any stripey pattern. Um, and from that, we then had to construct a computer model. And again, I'm not going to go into the details, but we've essentially d been playing around with different ways of screening all the possible simplest mathematical models that can fit the data in terms of the phases of which um, node in the model, whether it's BMP or Wnt, is in phase or out of phase of the other genes, and construct a model. The result of all of that is this, which is one of the criticisms that people have always given against Turing systems for explaining fingers is that a Turing pattern is not a controlled thing. I mean, it just goes you know, all over the place, and if you run it 10 times, you'll get 10 different results. Now, this is completely true. If we run our model in, with no extra control, but in our, in our limb bud growth model, you just get a labyrinthine pattern, which is a kind of typical Turing pattern. 
Furthermore, if I run this 10 times, you'll get 10 different patterns. Um, but to cut the long story short, what we gradually realized through many kinds of things and many kinds of experiments is that genes that are controlled in space and time have an influence on this Turing network. So for example, Hox A13 or D13, which are expressed in the same place, they have a specific pattern over space and time, um, which is represented here. If we let that pattern actually influence the parameters of the Turing system, you go from this to something like this. In this case, where it's restricted so that the Turing pattern only occurs within the Hox uh, D13 expression zone. This is still not very reliable, and it's not what fingers look like. But if we take another one, which is the FGF gradients, and allow them to influence the Turing pattern, we can get a totally reliable um, model where just the five stripes corresponding to your five fingers pop out. They actually pop out in the right order with digit four coming first, then three, then two, and then five and one later. You can see a comparison here. So this is our model. And you can see we're not caring about the other, the long bones at the moment. We're only caring about the fingers. But if you look at the time course of SOX9, it uh, matches very, very well. So in fact, our conclusion about this debate, which has been a big debate for, for a long time, is that to pattern something like this, you need both. You definitely, it definitely depends on a s local self-organizing process that is sort of similar to or maybe equal to a Turing system. But a Turing system alone is absolutely not enough. You need some more sort of uh, spatial control on the system, which you could call basically positional information. So that's our, our last example that I'm going to show you. So what I've basically shown you then is um, you know, how we generated lots of data, how we've integrated it, how we've been developing imaging tools, but also computational tools. But then most importantly is the kind of more fun bit is why to do all of this, because we spent years doing all of this. But the reason is to address actual clear conceptual questions that are un unclear in the literature. The other point is that, of course, um, this is not really a one-way flow like this. I mean, we sometimes talk about pipelines and we talk about putting data and then integrating and modeling or whatever. I mean, this is just one useful way of looking at things. But I mean, science doesn't work like this at all. Um, what's really missing here is the fact that uh, you make predictions and those predictions tell you what experiments to do next to try and break your model uh, and you go round and round like this. So this is also what we think of as a key thing for systems biology. And then the final thing is I showed you this model, but you know, and it, and it potentially seems great because it's linking a molecular feature to a, a macroscopic phenotypic um, result. Why would you believe it? Well, based on what I just said about you know, experiments and feedback and whatever, just gathering tons of data and putting it into the computer is not enough. You do have to try to break the system and test it. And for this case, we have managed to do that in various ways. Can this model, where we just took a lot of data, made a kind of model, simulated it, and got some results, can it really explain um, perturbations? And of course, what you would want to do is to take each node of your system and perturb it. Perturb it in experiments, perturb it in the model, and see how well it can predict things that were not going into the model in the first place. And this is just a summary to show you that uh, this is why we do believe the model to a large extent, not because of what I showed you, but what I'm showing you on this slide. Um, in a series of Hox mutations, which is essentially like an allelic series, because there's um, four Hox genes that are expressed in this region, as you knock out more copies of the Hox gene in mice, these are the phenotypes that you get in terms of fingers. You can't see them very well here, but you can get mice with 13 fingers, and they're almost completely normal apart from that. And it's going very linearly as a sort of um, a correlation with knocking out more Hox genes. The more Hox genes you knock out, the more the phenotype goes in this direction, until when you knock out the final one, you actually don't get any fingers. 
And in our model, if we do the same and gradually reduce this, we get the same result. The FGF, for our model to work, the FGF actually has to have an influence on the wavelength. And it seems a bit you know, abstract and maybe speculative to say that, well, FGF would have an influence on the wavelength of this Turing system that's modeled quite abstractly. But in fact, when we've done uh, micromass culture and put increasing amount of FGF into the culture, we do get increasing wavelength in the culture, which is exactly what would happen in, in the model. Um, finally, down here, the more sort of interesting results is that we can culture limb buds, not enough for them to grow well, as I said, but enough to show the pattern of the, the fingers developing. And the model predicts that if we inhibit the Wnt uh, pathway, instead of getting individual SOX9 domains, which for individual fingers, the fingers start to uh, grow and merge and grow, uh, sort of fuse into one big finger region. And it's actually exactly what happens in the experiments. If we inhibit BMP, we should get the opposite result, that the fingers disappear. And they do. And that BMP expression gets upregulated, which it does. But probably the best is that um, you know, the reviewers of the paper then forced us to do something more. Because you know, this is sort of, you could say this is just upregulation of a gene, and this is just downregulation of a gene. It's not really about a spatial pattern. It could just be. You know, boosting something or knocking it down. And we know we had to agree that they're right because the whole critical thing about spatial patterning and Turing patterns is the spatial dimension. So what we then were able to do actually is by having combinations of these drugs at different concentrations, we were able to show that both the model and in reality, you predict that you change the wavelength of this pattern. And I'm not showing it all here, but the beginning of this experiment, where you've just got two big fat digits, is where you've already got four fingers starting. You can just see it in the GFP, a faint pattern. And then you put these combination of drugs, reducing BMP signaling, reducing wind signaling, and the pattern reorganizes. So certain cells that were off switch on, certain cells that were on switch off, other cells that were on stay on, other cells that were off stay off. I mean, it's nothing about movements. It's that the cells start making different choices and they rearrange the pattern within the field of cells. So this is why we actually believe that the model must have something to do with reality, despite being you know, a very simple abstract model. Um, well, and is it relevant to congenital abnormalities? Probably yes, because for example, Hox genes are, are well known um, to be causes of these kind of abnormalities in, in humans. So, Lastly is that all that gene regulation stuff that I was showing you was in 2D, but of course we're working on a 3D model and um, this is just to show you how it's going, as it were. Um, I think there's another one over here. This is, this is the expression pattern of Hox A11 over space and time. And again, this is not the data. This is actually the dynamical PDE model over time. So, as I stressed at the beginning, I mean, what we've achieved so far is studying these different concepts separately. But you could even argue that some of those concepts could be explored with simpler models. The real goal, though, is to get them all into the same space, into the same model, because for sure they interact with each other. Digit patterning affects PD patterning and vice versa. They affect growth. Growth affects the, affects the patterning. So the idea is, as I was showing at the beginning, to get all of these processes going simultaneously in the same model so that we can understand the complicated kind of interactions of cause and effect between these things. Um, this, is, this is the kind of PD model that I showed you before. <coughs> this is the Turing-like model, although this diagram is from before we knew that it was BMP and WINS. And this is the growth that I was showing you, which again is controlled in our model essentially by FGF gradients and WINT gradients. And now we think that Wnt is one of these molecules. So all of these things really are sort of tangled up together, working simultaneously. So I would just like to um, thank uh, my lab for uh, doing all of this work, because obviously they did all of it. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much for this fascinating story. Um, let me first start with a couple of more, what I would say, like, in brackets, non-scientific questions. Sure. In the sense, like, what you show is, like, um, since you have more, like, a, originally a biology background and you come to all of this, yeah. how do you decide or how do you organize it to, to go to these models? Do you, at some point, find money, hire engineers and yeah. physicists, or do you <laughs> say you're going to talk to different groups? How do you see this interaction be mm. between biologists, physicists, mm. engineers, in order to get all this working? Okay. So, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the first thing to say is that I was more originally into kind of computing than biology, but as a kid, really. I mean, I was a total nerd. <laughs> so, um, and into electronics and stuff like that. So, in, in, the f in fact, for me, the beginning was sort of um, understanding how difficult it is to get systems that do controlled behavior and getting systems to do what you want. But then I got interested in biology because, of course, you, you, you saw kind of the genetic code and everything being quite like a code and, and et cetera. So then my formal training was all in biology, my, my degree and my PhD. But, um, and it was totally experimental with no computational stuff. But I was getting frustrated all the time. So I did five years of making transgenic mice and doing experiments. And the whole way through, I was just frustrated that there's no way we're going to be able to understand even the experiments that I'm doing without a computer model. Um, so I decided just to make a big um, switch at that point and to go specifically to just myself uh, to do a postdoc in, in modeling, which um, funnily enough, you know, one of the postdocs in my PhD lab told me was uh, scientific suicide. I mean, literally that's what he, he said because you know, biologists or experimentalists really did not have much faith in modeling. And maybe for good reasons, because I tried to point out that a number of models have been published with absolute disregard for the data <coughs> and uh, are pretty, you know, unhelpful. So anyway, I made that decision. And then I was looking around, you know, at uh, places to do the postdoc and talking to people and in the US as well. And the, the sort of general feedback coming back, and I felt this anyway myself, is you've got to do it in one lab. Collaborating. I mean, th there may be different experiences here, but back then, which isn't like nearly 20 years ago, um, people were confirming what I was suspecting, which is that, you know, I have to do both. I have to do the modeling and the experiment. So I decided from the beginning that I will, well, that was my postdoc, but then when I became independent, to build a lab that would have, you know, would be really interdisciplinary. And um, and it sort of worked pretty much from there. But as a result, I have always just employed directly myself uh, into the lab, physicists, engineers, and computer scientists. And, um, you know, I mean, at the moment I have, I think, six physicists and two computer scientists, and there are only three biologists. And that kind of works. I mean, the problem of collaborating, as many of you may know, is that what is a useful experiment or a set of data for a model is not necessarily a kind of experiment that will excite an experimentalist on their own. So having the two together and really packaging them as a sort of single interdisciplinary project, to me, seems to be the best way. So the direct communication between the engineers, the experimentalists, or in case of, for example, medicine, the, the medical doctors, is essential in order to get these things. So. I think that's it is. A, quite an important message also for most of the people. Eh? So really go to the data is, is very important. Yeah. Now partially related to that, and you also pointed it out, is like, as you, see, as you say, like there have been models published that in the end, I would say, turn out to be rubbish. Yeah. Uh, that's like in my way of speaking. <laughs> but partially it also it, it determines the field. Like in the beginning you say like you choose limb development, because there was a lot done. But on the other hand, there's also, to me at least, there would be a huge bias mm. in, for example, reviewers at both sides that said like, okay, this problem is solved. Namely, I published this. So whatever mm. you're going to do, you can't get published. Mm. 
And that's an experience that, that some of our people also already have. It's like, if you try to do it differently because you say like, look, whatever you published actually doesn't fit the data, so you should do it differently. Mm -hmm. Every reviewer is going to say like, like, no, 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 I mean, this is solved. You have to use this type of approach mm -hmm. because that's what everybody is doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have similar experiences and how to deal with this, like when be stubborn and go to this kind of data, change the world in a way, or when just kind of give up and... Uh, well, whatever has been done. I, I, d I don't know um, what I would give as advice. I just, I mean, our own experience is, is clear and maybe a bit similar to, to what you're suggesting, which is that at least, so I started being interested in, in, in modeling these Turing patterns uh, more than 10 years ago. We didn't publish it until relatively recently. But at the time when we started, the, the field was absolutely dead against that. And you know it wasn't formalized because we were not publishing anything and there was nothing discussed formally about this, but it was clear that people really hated it. Um, so, but I mean, what can you do if you believe <laughs> that something works in a certain way, you just have to follow that. So I knew that it was, well, I, I knew that there was a chance that it would be difficult. And some of the other things that we've been trying to uh, publish and push at the moment have also been essentially going against um, received wisdom, um, and it does make life more difficult. But I, you know, I think you just have to go with what you believe in. So, uh. so I think that's another very good message, eh? because a lot of us are trying to do things. Nobody believes in it. Reviewers say like, no, don't do it. If you believe in it, I think it's important. Just keep on doing it. Mm. Any other questions? Thank you very much, very nice presentation. I have one question. When you, in the experiments of crowd, I would like to know if you have observed uh, a variability in your measurements, or more or less the measurements are under the same conditions, you obtain very similar growth uh, response. Or I would like to know <coughs> uh, about the variability of the experiments, mm -hmm. and if, if this variability exists, uh, have you thought how to incorporate this in the models? Mm. Um, well, we have not really addressed variability, I have to admit. I mean, in a way, we've, you know, we've started with even an assumption that there is such a thing as the average normal uh, growth trajectory. And so then we've taken whatever data we could and averaged it into one growth trajectory. Um, how far that's true or not, well, r remains to be seen with, with more work. But I mean, w it is true that one advantage of studying a, a process like um, a developing organ is that you, I think it's reasonable to say that you know, a developing mouse limb is a developing mouse limb. And the things that we want to understand in the first instance are just how a mouse limb develops per se in general, because even that is far from clear. Um, I would only really go to looking at variability after we've got at least some basic mechanistic understanding of the average uh, behavior. But it is true that, for example, compared to things like studying tumor growth, I mean, there's a massive advantage here because no two tumors are exactly the same. So you would not be able to build up uh, an atlas of normal tumor growth because it's just not a controlled process. Whereas you can do that for something like uh, organogenesis. Other questions? Okay, then I want to thank you again. Then it's coffee time now. So thanks for being with us. Thank you. <laughs>